One of the things <clears throat> that's really, really important uh, to understand about the purpose of this talk is that your environment impacts your brain. And what I'm talking to you today about is a mission we should all be on to promote the health of our brain beginning in the womb onward. And so my approach with this is really lifestyle. Brain, I'm known as the lifestyle guy out there, okay? And there's kind of five components to the lifestyle I've put together, and this is nothing new to you guys. Nutrition, socialization, physical activity, mental stimulation, and spirituality. A lot of companies have hired me to help them bring this culture to their workforce. Emeritus is an assisted living company where you will see this uh, running through their, their facilities and their, their culture. And the question is, because you know a lot about this, the question is, how does it impact your brain? That's what we don't know. We know about this stuff for the heart, but we don't know is how it can impact the brain. And it can, and that's very exciting. At your next happy hour, okay, now we're not picking on you. This is usually where people start looking down thinking, oh, dear God, he knows. Um, let's, pick on your, let's pick on your friends, okay, or pick on me. The next happy hour, Dr. Nussbaum, you invite me, I'll go to happy hour with you. We're standing there, you know, you're looking for Mr. Wright and Mrs. Wright, and I'm just watching you. And Dr. Nussbaum has three, four drinks. Now, I'm, I try to be pretty graceful. I try to be socially ethical. I try to do the right thing. Don't always succeed. But, you know, after three, four drinks, man, do you ever... Did I ever tell you I love you? <laughs> Amory, I love you. <laughs> you know, Paul, would you please quit touching me, okay? <laughs> what happened to, is he being a jerk? Yeah, kind of is. Is that him? We don't think so. But the alcohol went into the frontal lobe, and what your frontal lobe does for you guys right now, basically, is it's telling you, for God's sake, don't stand up on the table, disrobe, and yell vulgarities. Okay? It's not a good time to do that right now. Okay? Literally, there's a social guard that sits up front and says, don't do that. When your frontal lobe is disabled by a disease, those are the people I see. They're not bad people. Or by alcohol, stuff comes out that you don't typically see. Prisons are filled with people with frontal lobe problems. Okay? Another kind of example out in the world that's on the normal continuum probably, but maybe you know about this person. Y'all have a friend in here, and this is not a compliment, who's always there. Mm -hmm. Like you do everything in your intellectual power to convince them the conversation ended 10 minutes ago. You turn around, they're right there, okay? First at the party, last to leave. Don't get the social cues. We call that a sticky personality, sticky. Or as my neuropsychiatry friend from Great Britain described it at a large conference one time, the person was socially adhesive. <laughs> That's a frontal lobe thing. It's why the baby, if you put their fi your finger out, will grab. If I put my, you go to the restaurant tonight, just stick your finger out at the waiter, okay? He's not going to grab your finger, okay? When I'm on a wing with people that have dementia, it's good to touch. I mean, you've got to be socially appropriate, but it's good to touch. That can be very therapeutic. I will literally take them, can I borrow your hand for a second? You won't sue me, okay? So I'll take, you know, Mrs. Jones by her hand. I'll just stroke it. What's your name? Sue. Sue's just doing what a normal, healthy frontal lobe does. Her hand's not moving, okay? But if Sue had a frontal lobe problem from advanced Alzheimer's, she would grab my fingers, okay? Or she wouldn't let go. Or if you come onto the unit and you're the new person, that person with Alzheimer's, if the frontal lobe is hit, will start to come towards you. Kind of looks scary particularly if you're like, let's say, a grandchild coming to visit grandma and Mrs. Jones keeps coming after you, or they may grab your shirt and not let you go. That's just a sign of frontal lobe has, has gone away, okay? Everybody say this, hippocampus. hippocampus. This is a deep structure inside your temporal lobe. I think it's the most important part of your body where you learn new information. This lays down your life story. This is where you generate new brain cells. This is where stress affects you structurally and functionally in the brain. If you're under chronic stress, I see patients who have been attacked, victimized, traumatized. I see veterans with PTSD. They have memory problems. That's why, okay? The good news is we can heal from that, but we gotta work at that. 
There's not a pill to get you through that. This is also part of the brain that gets hit very early in Alzheimer's. Very early in Alzheimer's, what problems do we see? The person has what kind of problems? Memory problems, short term, that's right. Because this is where you learn new information. Doctor, he's driving me crazy. He can't remember that he had breakfast five minutes ago and I don't understand how he can tell me who his second grade band teacher was. Well, because the second grade band teacher's up here. Breakfast five minutes ago is new learning. That's why there's no new learning, okay? No new learning, okay, with Alzheimer's. That's, that's, that's difficult. So they do what a lot? Repeat. And you're the caregiver, what are you gonna have to do? Repeat. And that's where a caregiver begins to wear out, all right? That's why. Now, quickly, I'm getting a lot of patients coming in to see me in their 50s who think they have Alzheimer's. It's interesting to me. It's gotten so bad that I've gone to Kinko's and I've blown this thing up. So if you come into my office, you'll see this sitting in the corner, okay? So a person comes in to see me and say, you know, I'm scared. I think I have Alzheimer's. Why do you think I have Alzheimer's? Because I have memory problems. I said, sit down. I don't do anything else. Sit down. I go get my little billboard. I bring it over, put it there. I said, number one, you don't have Alzheimer's. I'm not going to do any testing or anything. You don't have Alzheimer's. What, why do I think you don't have Alzheimer's? Because yes, a 50-year-old can have Alzheimer's, but it ain't you. Okay, because statistically, this is not going to happen. Okay? I understand you've seen them, but 300 million Americans, not going to happen that much. Okay, so I tell them to sit down. So, what I say to the person is, um, I'm going to take you through a little education here in my office. I understand it's not why you came to see me, but this is what you need to know, because you're telling me you have memory problems. The brain had a wonderful thing happen to it many, many millions of years ago. Okay, we were being chased by saber-toothed tigers. And we had to evolve, and the fact that we did this tells us we're here today. Otherwise, we were going to be the happy meal. Okay? Mm -hmm. And what the brain did was it developed this part of it to set an alarm off. Warning, 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 danger, danger, danger. Run or fight. And what happens in this wonderful part of you called the amygdala, which is the next door neighbor of the hippocampus. Hippocampus learns new information. The amygdala is the next door neighbor, a little bit bigger in men than in women. It gets set off. Warning, warning, warning. Neuropinephrine's flooding your brain. Adrenaline's flooding your body. Your heart's pumping very fast. Your lungs expand, you need oxygen. Your biceps are getting bigger because you need to fight. Your digestive tract stops. You don't need to eat. Your reproductive system stops. You don't need to have sex right now. You don't need to have a baby right now. I'm about to be eaten, okay? Wonderful thing helped us survive. Today, we don't have any saber-toothed tigers chasing us. But we still have this brilliant system. In fact, it's gotten so brilliant. As I tell Americans, you could be laying in your bed with your onesie on, okay? <laughs> Comfortable place, safe place, I would hope and I presume looking up at your ceiling, it's early in the morning, and you're thinking to yourself, this is what I have to do today. And you come upon that synaptic event that tells you at 10.30 you have to go to a meeting with that SOB, Dr. Nussbaum, and suddenly in your nice safe bed in your onesies, your amygdala just starts to fire. Your heart's pounding in your bed based on a thought. That's how sophisticated it is. When the amygdala fires, your hippocampus shuts off. So, my question to the person who came to see me is my question I have for you, and it's rhetorical. Think about it. What's your saber-toothed tiger? Tell me about your saber-toothed tigers in life. What's chasing you? What are you afraid of? I have them. You do too. Some people get defensive. Oh, I don't have any of that. Okay, let's try it another way. Tell me about your sleep. How's your irritable bowel syndrome? any ulcers, migraine headaches, relationship issues. That's another way of the body telling you, I'm not in balance. And when the amygdala fires, you lose balance. And so in my life, when my amygdala fires, and it does, and I get out of balance, I literally self-talk now, settling my amygdala down, telling myself there's no saber-toothed tiger here. 
Because you can actually, now that you see this, you can actually work with this. This really helps people. Okay, it's not just saying I'm stressed. That's not good enough. We all know what that means, but this gives you a tangible thing to work on, okay? But it requires you being conscious of it. Most of the time, you're not conscious of what is stressing you out. This is what brain health is, and this is the real value here today. You're gonna to see brain health. It's a great marketing tool. It's a great thing everybody wants to write about in the media. We don't explain it well enough, okay? I'm gonna explain it to you right now. I've already told you it happens up in the cortex. At the cellular level, you have trillions of brain cells, friends, and they can connect with about seven to 10,000 other brain cells. Do we know that for sure? Absolutely not. But you know, when you do the math, what I just said to you, the number you come up with is greater than the number of atoms in the universe. Y'all understand what we're talking about here, okay? You all have a core in your body. Well, each brain cell has a core. Coming out of the core, you have a long arm called an axon. Everyone say that. Axons. Okay, that's a, a part of the brain cell that takes information away from the core out into the world trying to communicate with other brain cells, okay? It's insulated by the fat, that green stuff up there called the myelin sheath. Physical activity and eating proper fats help to build a robust myelin sheath that insulates the nerve tract. Without it, you slow down information. Motor skill slows down, MS is an example. Brain cells get very close, they have a chemical marriage, they never touch each other, that's called a synapse. That's how you think, move, and emote. That's how it works. Coming into the brain cell, you have this part of your brain cell called a dendrite. Everyone say dendrite. <laughs> kind of like branches of a tree. Fingers on a hand, right? When you plop your brain down into an environment, it does not have a choice, it reacts. It's reacting right now. If the environment is novel and complex, it's good for the brain, it's not rotten passive, novel and complex, your brain cells react by developing more dendrites, okay? And if you do that across your lifespan, you build up a brain that looks very much like what I call a jungle. You want your brain to look like a jungle. And here's why, and I'm not trying to be funny right now. If you think of Alzheimer's disease like a weed whacker, imagine taking a weed whacker into a jungle. How long is it gonna take you to show any kind of impact versus maybe just one palm tree on a Caribbean island? Today, at autopsy, there's about 30% of brains well diagnosed with Alzheimer's, the disease is there. At death, we see it, it's there. 30% of those brains never manifest in memory problems. They remain very independent. We don't know how that can be, to be quite honest with you, but one of the things is we found in those patients that were able to fight it off, even though it was there, their brains kind of look like jungles because they had lifestyles that were very novel and complex, very enriched. We call this defense mechanism brain resilience. Everyone say that. Brain my book and my work and the culture of brain health I'm talking about, making your home a brain health area, your school, your work setting, is really about building brain resilience. Okay, that's what it's about. That's what the journey we need to be on, beginning in the womb, and after that, it's never too late or too early to begin, because here's the secret, your brain doesn't know how old you are, and it doesn't care. All that stuff is just stuff we've made up. Hallmark knows it, right? But otherwise, it's really, it just wants to be stimulated, okay? We know people with higher levels of education, people with more sophisticated occupations tend to have a lower risk of Alzheimer's. That's because those are environments that build up brain resilience. I'm a big believer in environmental input in terms of things like forgiveness and love and patience and compassion being very good for the brain, okay? The opposite of that is hostility, anger, you know, you can, you can keep filling in the blanks, right? That, that really are bad for the brain. Set off what? Like Anne Maria said earlier, the amygdala, okay? So in my practice, we talk about those things, okay? All of those things. It's just not a diagnosis medication kind of thing, all right? All these things probably have much bigger impact on our lives and on our general well-being than, than those other things. So in the 50s, we learned if you placed a rat in an enriched environment where there were other rats, socialization, there was a running will, physical activity, and there were toys to play with, mental stimulation, 
compared to a rat raised in isolation, their brains were much better. The enriched environment led to a much healthier, robust brain. You remember my brain health lifestyle? Socialization, mental stimulation, physical activity. That's where it comes from. Now, I add two for the human brain, nutrition and spirituality. The reason is we learned in 1998 that the human brain can generate new brain cells in the hippocampus. The same area we learned in the 1950s that rats were generating new brain cells. The hippocampus. It's very fascinating. It's not coincidental. So you get into this whole area of brain health and wellness because your brain has plasticity. It can be shaped. We're talking about it being shaped for health in a proactive way. Thinking about what's novel and complex. And really thinking about yourself right now in terms of becoming integrated. You're fragmented animals, so am I. Most of the people walking out there and the people that you work with and even live with aren't even conscious of what we're talking about right now. That's how far away we are from all this. In order to work at this, you have to be conscious at it and to try to become integrated, okay? Very, very hard. So what does the research tell us in terms of socialization? I had a conversation earlier with somebody about their family member wasn't, was withdrawing. It's coming, not coming out of the room anymore. Socialization is good for the brain because it has that brain remain engaged with others. When the brain's engaged with others, there's a novel and complex environment. When it isolates, doesn't come out of the room or withdraws from activities, you're using that subcortex and the brain's now becoming rote and passive and Alzheimer's disease now is a risk factor. So is loneliness. How many of you genuinely have ever asked your loved one if they're lonely? It's a weird question. Let alone your peers at work or your residents. Anybody being admitted to any one of your buildings, you should ask that question right after age. Age, education, you should always ask about handedness. Ask them if they're lonely, because that predicts a brain that's emotionally isolated, increased risk for dementia. Okay? In 2007, we discovered that. We have to ask that question. We don't. Hobbies are very, very good, because what it does is it helps build up their brain resilience. If somebody tells you, I can do this, 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 and this, versus somebody says, you know, I haven't done much of anything since that. Those are two different brains. Okay. Every year we have a wonderful laboratory for expression of psychopathology. It's called Thanksgiving Holiday, okay? It brings out all the wonderful traits we have in our families, right? And by that I mean we have to really think about forgiveness and letting go of those things that are toxic and where you find the toxins in your life tend to be where the blood is. You can have toxins with friends as well, but it tends to be more family members. Um, so forgiveness becomes very, very powerful so that you're not carrying around those toxins of anger. It's hard for me. I work on that. I'm sure it's hard for you too. It's just part of being human, but we got to work at it, okay? And I don't believe in retirement the way it's currently positioned in our country, which is essentially a kind of a subtle message of go be passive. Doesn't mean people are, but the more important message is each and every day you got to wake up with a purpose in life. Now, a number of you guys are carrying these pins around that you got on your shirts. That may or may not be your mission in life, but if it ain't, you got to figure out what it is. Because if you don't get that, you're going to die prematurely. I know it'll say heart attack on the death certificate, but that ain't it. Now imagine me having this conversation with 17-year-olds. Okay? What's your role and purpose in life? They're going to live forever, right? That's what they think. Unless you know something I don't, what do you want it to be said about you if today's it? And that, that basic question doesn't get asked. And you ain't going to find the answer in the HR office. Okay, so it's an interesting thing to think about yourself. Physical activity, because 25% of the blood goes to the brain. We've actually dosed this now. If you walk a mile a day briskly for six days a week, you reduce your risk of dementia. I've seen the slides that look at those that engage in aerobic exercise and physical activity and how the hippocampus changes in size. Direct relationship, okay? And we also know that kids that are engaged in physical activity, their scores are higher in school. And old people like me, who engage in physical activity, my risk of Alzheimer's disease declines. We know that now. Very interesting. Physical activity, very robust finding. Dance, very powerful brain health promoting exercise. In the classroom, I teach them, when you're learning Shakespeare, dance. The classroom should be set up with stationary bikes and treadmills. That's the way the brain wants it to be. We don't do it that way. And I, the kids all get a jazz, they get jazzed up when I say this. I'll say it to you. It's probably the only thing you remember from my talk today. You have no learning cells in your buttocks. Okay? You say like Forrest Gump, it even gets more funny, okay? In your buttocks. 
And by that I mean we're sitting. Look at how stationary we are. We have to be out moving, boogieing, okay, dancing, shaking each other when we're doing this kind of stuff and we're trying to learn. That's what the brain likes, okay? That's what the brain likes. Mental stimulation. What's new and hard? Language development. Very good. Your baby, before that baby can speak orally, can learn 20 signs. The reason that's important is by the second grade, that baby that learns sign language has a higher IQ relative to babies not exposed to sign language. The reason a higher IQ is important for purposes of today is a higher IQ early in life reduces the risk of Alzheimer's later in life. Okay? Poverty in childhood increases the risk for Alzheimer's disease. Things, these environments early in life set us up for success or failure, okay, if you will. Board games, very, very good. Travel we talked about. Everything that is really kind of novel and complex. I told you about Fit Brains, which is an online brain fitness exercise program. Music we talked about. If you don't know how to play an instrument, there's your novelty and complexity. Go to it. You might kill everybody around you that has to listen to it, but that's not the point, okay? And get up and sing. Don't worry about it, okay? Get up and sing a little bit. It'd be good for you. Spirituality, this really goes to putting in balance the amygdala with the analytic part of your brain. Your brain has two really wonderful parts. The cold front part of the brain, that's the parent. If that's too engaged in your life, you're not going to be passionate. Then you've got the part down below, more primitive, more impulsive, more hot. The hot part of you, that's the teenager with the keys, without the parent around, okay? If your hot part of your brain gets out in front of that cold part of your brain, you will be apologizing at some point in your life. Okay? And we all do that. You know, I'm sorry. I acted like an idiot there. I'm sorry. Probably going to do it again, but I want you to know this time I'm sorry. Okay? Um, Two-year-olds have temper tantrums. Forty-nine-year-olds have temper tantrums. The hot air of my brain gets out in front. The, the goal is to become balanced. Okay? So we do settle that amygdala through things like relaxation. When you take a deep breath in, you have to understand that you're setting your amygdala off when you do that. So when I work with patients on mindfulness and these kinds of things, we, we teach them the structure first. So when you take a deep breath in and hold it, it's uncomfortable. You're setting off the amygdala. You're drowning. Now when you let it go, it feels very pleasurable. And that's setting off a different part of your brain called the parasympathetic nervous system, which is known as the rest and digest part of you. When you engage in meditation, you're working on filtering out all that nonsense. You ever try to meditate or just close your eyes? You start thinking, yeah, this really feels good. This feels good. This really feels good. Let's see. I've got a 3 o'clock appointment today. No, no, no. Get back to this. Feels good. Feels good. Okay, let's see. Did I buy the remote the meatloaf for later today? No, no, no. Don't think about that. Okay, think, okay, okay. Did you hear the car just going by, Paul? No, no, no. That's what's going on in your head. Interestingly, people that meditate or prayer, pray, they have self-talk. Do you have that? You ever do that? Is that the way you pray? Do you hear a voice? Not everybody does it. When you hear a voice, your frontal lobe's lighting up in the scanner. If you don't hear a voice and you just report, I'm taken over by a spirit, no voice, just taken over by a spirit, um, the frontal lobe shuts off in your brain. Both still end up in the same peaceful state. You ever hear him say something like, I was like one with my world? One with my world. The amygdala gets lined up with the front part of the brain. And that's peace. Unfortunately, sometimes we only experience that when there's crisis. 2001, you guys had that. Everything got locked in, hyper-focused. You were hyper-focused. You weren't worrying about everything else. We have to get there without crisis, okay? Prayer on a daily basis enhances the immune system. A child that eats one meal a day with the parents, more emotionally stable, more cognitively capable. Finally, nutrition. Two major food groups for the brain. There's a whole field called nutritional neurosciences, by the way. Omega-3 fatty acids, your brain, your body does not produce them, you got to get them. You get them through good fats, omega-3s are good fats, in the fish. We're supposed to be eating about eight ounces of fish per week. If you're not getting eight ounces of fish per week, you're not eating nuts, walnuts, and almonds, green leafy vegetables, enough to get that amount of omega-3s, you have to think about a supplement. Uh, and there are many out there, fish oil is not a a pure omega-3 tends to be a large tablet. It has a lot of filler in it, fishy aftertaste. I'm one of these humans that's trying to eat more fish. I'm not where I just told you I need to be. So I take Moxor, which is, an, is a supplement, 
okay? Very small tablet you can see there. There's information on my website if you're interested. Talk it over with your doctor. These supplements are not miracles. They're not cures. Don't believe anybody that tells you that. But omega-3s do help brain function at the cellular level, help with mood, help with memory, help with energy, help with attention deficit issues, okay? Um, the other major food group, Antioxidants, fancy way of saying fruits and vegetables. As I teach it, it's kind of like the broom you take out in the spring to get rid of all the dust in your garage. In this case, the dust in your body are called free radicals. We all have them. Your body doesn't produce antioxidants. You get to eat six fistful servings of fruits and vegetables a day. The food has color, probably has an antioxidant in it. It's good, okay? Why grape, you've heard about red wine, like a glass a day, it's good for you, that's why. It's the red grapes. If you don't like alcohol, grape juice is very good. You may have heard Larry King talking to you about the antioxidant power of grape juice, okay? That's why. Um, little behavioral tip, if you just use utensils when you eat, you're gonna eat healthier and you're gonna eat less. Kind of interesting. My generation uses their fingers to eat. And when we do that and we don't have utensils, check what you're eating, be conscious of it, it's interesting. Let me conclude this way. Um, we talked today about becoming integrated um, as you go on your journey. Now, and you're going to get this book today. It's a good, it's a good, you know, I don't make, you know, I make pennies off this, so I feel com comfortable saying this to you. It's a good book for the family because, um, like the book you get, share it with a lot of family members, okay? You don't have to go buy another one. Just share it with family members. And, and you'd be surprised your kids can get it. And if they can, I want to know because I'm not doing my job, okay? So I'm trying to communicate to teens up. Um, you know, as I said, I started this when I was 20, and, and you guys know what I'm talking about. When you're sitting across the table with somebody who has Alzheimer's disease and the child of that person is sitting next to you and he doesn't recognize her, that's one of those moments that sends a chill up your spine, you know? And you do that enough, and I still do this work like I know you do. You either, I don't know, I guess you either kind of give in because it's hard, uh, or you fight, and, and as I told you, I act, I'm a, I, I act. Um, and this is what kind of led me to try to put something together that deals with that difficulty, that says, I want to get out there and speak to thousands of brains that don't have Alzheimer's. So attack the same animal, but do it from a different front. And to educate the general public about this miracle that sits between your ears so that you'll love it, it's you, and that you begin to do some of the things we know are good for the brain. There's no cure, there's no prevention. We ain't perfect, okay? <clears throat> Alzheimer's disease is a lot of things. Medically, it's the presence of neuritic plaques, okay, neurofibrillary tangles, the presence of apolipoprotein. You with me? That's not the way most people talk, okay? My job is to communicate with mothers and dads across the dinner table. I understand you can get that, but that ain't the way most people talk. You know what Alzheimer's disease is for me? It's a brain that's lost access to its life story. You with me? It's a brain that's lost access to its life story. When you, when you get to that level, now you're down in the mud. Now you're dealing with the emotional stuff. The other stuff is so technical, so clinical, it's, it's a defense mechanism in some ways. So. Sitting next to each and every one of you in here today is an invisible bag. It's been with you your whole life. And in the invisible bag, on a daily basis, you're placing life experiences. You're doing it today. And you're building up your, your autobiography. I call it your life story. It's the most precious gift you have. And you have access to it today and we take it for granted. And if you go to your twilight, which may be today, or my twilight, which may be today, and you're going on or I'm going on to a better place, there will be a little one in your life circle who's gonna come up to you and take you by your hand and look you square in the eye and say, share with me your life story. I wanna know. And you know, in my experience, guys, in basements, of five and hallways of thousands. If you notice, it just got really quiet. And this is what happens. 
what's just happened in here is you just personalized the message. It's personal right now. You're, you're, we've aligned the amygdala with the analytic part. It's about you right now. It's about bigger things in your name tag. It's about bigger things than Dr. Nussbaum or any company you work for. Important stuff. And so what I've tried to share with you today is a pathway that says, hey, flash the light over here. Walk this way. It's not perfect. We hope for a cure for these things, but in the meantime, let's do what we know is good for our brain regardless. Think about what's novel and complex for you. Think about these lifestyle issues, how you can make some baby step changes each and every day to build up brain resilience, that natural defense against dementia. Think about how you can share this information with those that you love in your life circle first, and then those that you care for professionally second. Because if it isn't done on your plate first, you're not going to be as effective a professional caregiver, okay? So I hope you think about these things. It's been a real pleasure for me to be with you here today. Um, I think we have some goodies to hand out here for you. And um, I'm happy to, to stick around here and answer any questions or listen to any criticism, whatever you want to do, okay? Thank you very much.